I joined West Ham or signed for West Ham on my 27th birthday, which is the 8th of December 1977. Um, and I was fairly apprehensive, to be fair, because I'd considered West Ham to be one of the big clubs. Um, I knew the players that were there because I played against them only recently. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a daunting prospect for somebody who'd not been used to playing in, in the big city to move down and uh, and be part of a club as big as West Ham. Um, and I know, well, I, I did learn later that it, it is a family club, but when you're playing up north and in the Midlands and you think of London clubs, you do tend to think that they're the big deal, you know, and um, I was concerned that I might not be good enough to be playing with these lads. Luckily for me, it was probably the best decision I ever made to sign for John Lyle that day. When I joined the club, it was early December and, you know, the form hadn't been great at the club. I was aware of that. We were in the bottom three. Hadn't won a game up until that point. And I signed on a Wednesday stroke Thursday night with a game on Saturday at home to Manchester United, which I couldn't play in because I'd signed too late. You know, the, I needed to be a 48 hour um, a deadline. and. Uh, I didn't watch the game, I came home and, and got all my stuff together in preparation for the next week, the first, first week of training, but you know, it was brilliant to see that they won that game against Man United that day. Trevor Brooking scored the winner and it, it kind of gave me a little bit of a lift as well because thinking that maybe the, the new signing, a new striker might have even lifted the lads. I mean, it might sound a bit daft, but uh, you know, it was good that they'd won that game, it took a bit of pressure off. Uh, off all of the lads uh, and I could then look forward to my debut the next week which ironically was against the club that I just left which was West Brom. London's burning, a scene reminiscent of Britain's wartime blitz but this was a fire with a difference for fighting the flames were not professional firemen but naval ratings the reason, the first national fireman strike in British history. It's a crisis that set arguments raging between the government, the country and the firemen themselves. I realised, obviously, that John Lyle had signed me to score goals to, to hopefully keep the side up. Um, I'm sure by the time Christmas had come round, the fans were used to the fact that we were down the bottom of the league and, and would probably be hoping that if we could save ourselves from relegation, that would be some kind of success. Uh, and I was a part of that, obviously, as a goal scorer. My job was to score enough goals to keep the side up. Um, I did score goals, but clearly not enough because we went into the last game of the season needing to beat Liverpool at home and uh, you know obviously we, we didn't win that game they were far too good for us they were a good side you know Liverpool was that iconic 70s side with all, with all those good players in it um, Dalgleish and Souness um, etc uh, and on that day we, we weren't good enough to beat them but you don't get relegated because you lose the last game of the season you get relegated because of the previous 41 and, and you know we hadn't done enough in those previous 41 games no the only thing i remember one incident when i um i had a bit of a battle with uh phil neal and graham soonus which graham and i always seem to have a bit of a battle whenever i played against him but i think i got Phil Neal a little bit late um, and he went down, he was injured and I remember Kenny Dalgleish coming up to me and, and giving me a bit of stick saying, you know, don't you realise we've got the European Cup final next Wednesday? And I said to him, I said, don't you realise if we lose this game we go down, Kenny? I said, let's get it in perspective. Um, and he kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, all right, fair enough. Uh, but Phil was all right anyway. I mean, it, it was just a bit of a late tackle, which... Uh, um, seemed to be one of the things that, uh, that happened to me quite a lot over my West Ham career. We were very disappointed, but you, you've got to bear in mind that 
again, that it wasn't a cup final. It wasn't a one-off game that you thought, if we win, it's great. If we lose, it's, it's bad. It was a culmination of 40-odd games, you know, and we knew that we'd got ourselves in a decent position to be able to win that game, we stay up. Um, and we didn't win it, but we were almost resigned to the fact that, you know, we hadn't been good enough all season. And uh, in some ways, um, in some ways, being defeated kind of builds you up again. Um, and, and I got the feeling from John Lyle, not that he ever said anything about it, but that he could at last clear the decks because what had happened at the start of the season, I mean, I was John's first signing as manager because he'd taken over from Ron Greenwood who'd got the England job earlier that season. So John had obviously got an idea in his mind of which players he wanted to keep and which players he wanted to let go. And the fact that we'd gone down in some ways gave him the chance to do what he wanted to do in terms of letting the players go that, that he didn't feel were going to be in contention for places the next season and bring players in who, who he wanted to sign. So in some ways it kind of cleared the decks for John um, and it might have been a bit of a relief for us as well thinking okay we've, we've gone down but we're a good side, we're better than this and next season we'll come straight up. Um, which actually didn't happen, but uh, you know, probably that's how we felt. You know, an immediate disappointment. Obviously, we, I think the thing when you do get relegated is you feel you've let people down. Uh, not so much yourselves. You know, you're disappointed for yourselves. But um, you know, we let, we probably let those thirty thousand people who walked up Green Street every every Saturday afternoon. You know, we probably felt that we'd let them down, and you know, that's a big disappointment. There's a responsibility there. You know. We, we're footballers, those people have been working hard all week and their outlet on the, on the Saturday is to go and watch their team and cheer them on and, and, and we let them down over a season, not over one match, but over, over the season we really let them down. And personally I felt a little bit responsible, I was John's first signing and he'd signed me to score the goals to keep us up and I, one more goal might have been enough, but, but you know, it didn't happen. shall not be calling for a general election at this time. Instead, I ask every one of you to carry on with the task of consolidating the improvement now taking place in our country's position. Let's see it through together. I think he's made a mistake, and I think his decision is really against the nation's best interests. He's lost his majority, and when that happens, I think you lose the authority to govern. You know, this face, they've got to buy bread and things like this, but we're wallpaper, it comes under luxury goods, doesn't it? Because they've got to cut down, haven't they? Because um, you just can't afford it. And so you've got to look at it this way. Most majority of people around this area have got some work involved with falls. I remember the start of the, of the next season. We, fairly certain we played Notts County early on, might have even been the first game of the season and I think we beat them 5-1 five, five, and I scored a hat-trick. I think Pop Robson got two as well and I was really looking forward to playing with Pop because he was one of my schoolboy idols because I'd been a Newcastle United fan um, from, you know, from realising what football was all about. Um, and Pop, I saw Pop play as a 17 year old for Newcastle you know, and, and he was one of those people that all of a sudden I'm playing alongside, you know, somebody who I'd watched from the terraces at St. James's Park. So, and I knew what a player he was. Um, and I felt that that was a good combination, you know, smash and grab, if you like, you know, I was the smash and he was the grab. Fantastic finisher. And I learned a lot from Brian. I learned a lot in that first season playing for West Ham about where to run and who did what. One particular thing I always remember watching Brian do was, when Trevor was on the ball and, and the movement Pop made um, when Trevor was in wide positions and, and I, I weighed up exactly what he did and when Brian left the club you know I started doing exactly the same as he'd done and, and I got probably 
half a dozen goals just by that the one little thing that I've picked up off Brian. Um, and I did learn a lot from him. To be fair, I was 27, probably he would be 33 or 4 at that time and very experienced, you know, so I wasn't daft. I knew I didn't, I know I wasn't a complete player and um, picking things up from players like him and strikers like him, you know, that was, that was great for me to be able to do that. And although I didn't know it at the time, you know, the next five years was a massive learning thing for me off, off from learning from John Lyle about little things that that mattered, you know, they, they, all talk, they always talk about the games of inches, don't they, you know, and little small margins, and I learnt a lot from John, just little things that helped, you know, just um, just gave me the edge over, over defenders, which which really meant the, that my goal ratio at West Ham was better than it had been at any other club I'd played for, I mean, if I look back over the 220 games I played, I, I got 99 goals for the club, and I suppose that's almost one in two, one in two and a bit. Whereas previously I was something like a goal every third game or a goal every three and a half games for the other clubs I played for. So I think those little bits of stuff that I'd learnt in my late twenties um, was a factor in, in, in the fact that I got so many goals for the club. Barking is just one of dozens of councils hit by the strike. Its 2,500 manual workers walked out yesterday, stopping services throughout the borough. Today, the dustmen turned pickets, making sure no council lorries were used to clear the rubbish. Only members of the public were allowed across the picket line to get rid of their rubbish before the sacks outside their homes became health hazards. All schools in the borough have closed because there are no caretakers, but the 27,000 children affected will have to stay at home. There are no parks, libraries or play centres open. The council's lorry fleet is locked up, and the Meals on Wheels service is running down as the strike spreads. About 40 pensioners eat council meals every lunchtime in this hall. Now it's closed. For pensioners like this who can't get out because of illness, the council and the unions are negotiating to maintain Meals on Wheels. But many are already relying solely on their neighbours to bring home food. The strike has shut cemeteries as well. The council stopped taking bookings for burials last week as the grave diggers came out. Now undertakers are being forced to embalm or freeze corpses in local mortuaries. David Smith, News at 10, East London. Well, it seems so cool. We were a good football inside. We were, in some respects, that was a kick in the teeth because it meant that you weren't a threat. And when I played against West Ham, for other sides, Norwich, Coventry, West Brom, I played against West Ham several times and always felt they were a bit of an easy touch that pretty pretty boys who pass the ball and you know little things with the outside of the foot and you know if you really went at them hard you'd probably beat West Ham and that was one of the reasons when I went there where I thought maybe there's something I can change about that you know maybe I'm a bit different to the to the what might be a typical West Ham player maybe bashing people around and being a threat and being a physical threat was was maybe a plus, you know, and, and something that West Ham fans might not be all that used to, and it might be a bit different. So I was aware of that, um, and aware of the fact that we like to watch West Ham. You know, if you watch a match today and West Ham were on, you, you like watching them, you know, because it was good football. It was, you know, passing, the, the, you know, the John Lyle, Ron Greenwood stuff. You know, passing and moving, pass and move, you pass the ball. Uh, you move, you create something. You keep hold of the ball, you protect it you know, you, you're going to give it back to one of your players and someone else is moving and that's how we were. We, we did that at Chadwell Heath for five years. Um, so being everyone else's second team was good in one respect, but a little bit, you know, we wanted to be a bit more ruthless than that. You know, we wanted people not to like us. You know, we were disappointed we didn't go up. We couldn't believe that we, you know, we thought we were the best side in it. Genuinely felt that, you know, without being too arrogant. Um, and maybe we, we'd just gone with a bit of overconfidence into that season. Uh, you know, 
massive thing for us was Trevor staying. You know, the fact that he de he declared uh, as we went down, and the newspaper people asked him, you know, was he going to leave because it was felt that being a second division player might uh, make it difficult for him to continue his international career. But Trevor made the statement that he was going to stay at the club, which was a big boost for all of us. You know, our best player was staying. Um, you know, we still have Bill at the back, and we got a you know an up and coming Alan Devonshire, who became one of you know the best players I ever played with, um, which is strange because of where he came from. You know, coming from a non-league side for five or ten thousand pounds, you know, which was peanuts in those days, um, and Alan was just you know such a good player. So we had good players, and we just felt that. You know, we were gonna we were gonna come straight back up, bounce up, and, and start again. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We and again, that was we had to look at ourselves you know, and say, well, why is that? Why is that happening? You know, have we switched off? Have we felt it was too easy? It was a blow for us because all of a sudden we're thinking we're a first division side in the second division. Now, hang on a minute, lads. No, we're not. We're a second division team. as he leaves to enter his official car to go to see Her Majesty the Queen and to tender his resignation. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. And again, I think John let players go that uh, he probably felt, you know, wasn't, weren't going to be in contention. Uh, and he, he made two, what I would consider terrific signings. One was a young Scots lad who no one knew anything about, but he turned to be like, turned out to be one of the best players West Ham have ever had, um, which, which is Ray Stewart. And for me, the icing on the cake and the last piece of the jigsaw in terms of making us a proper side was, was signing Phil Park from Queen's Park Rangers. Quite how John managed to p persuade Phil to leave QPR, I don't know, but um, as soon as I saw him come in, I mean, we became big fr friends, you know, he, if I had considered one lad who was my pal during my whole time at West Ham, it would have been Phil. I mean, Stuart Pearce and I were very close, especially in the last couple of seasons, um, because we played up front together, but I just, Phil was just such a good bloke, you know, such a real nice, Lad, but when I saw him come in the dressing room the first day, this big presence, you know, and I thought he's going to be good, he's going to be all right, and that's how it worked out. You know, we felt so secure with Phil at the back, and even if you made a mistake in midfield and I'd lost the ball and they got through behind Bill and Alvin, you know, you felt almost well, it's all right, Phil will save it, and he usually did. You know, he made some terrific saves, he was never spectacular, very functional, but just got on with it and. You know, you just felt, we're all right here. We, we knew we could score goals, we knew we had that in us as a team, but we had been slack at the back in terms of, um, you know, sometimes easy goals going in where, you know, the, the, the opposition hadn't worked that hard to score goals, where we felt we had to work hard to get a goal, and, and then we'd, we'd let easy goals in, and um, Simon Phil was a big one for me, you know, I felt that's good. I always thought that, if you were strong down the middle, you got a chance. So if you look at it from the back, big goalkeeper, centre half, Billy Bonds, central midfield, Trevor Brookin, up front, me. You know, and, and I felt that responsibility was on me to, to make that those four players through the centre of, of, of the pitch. Um, you know, I was part of that deal, and you know, I I wanted to be part of that deal. To think, you know, I'm a, I'm a West Ham player, you know, and I mean, it was a big thing for me playing for West Ham. I know I'd played for Norwich City and Coventry City and West Brom, but when I signed for West Ham United, I felt I've arrived here. 27, I should know the game. Um, I've got a lot of games under my belt, I've scored a lot of goals. But West Ham, playing for Lon a London club, this is a big deal for me. Uh, and I was very proud to play for West Ham. I was proud to play for all the other clubs I played for, don't get me wrong, but playing for West Ham, was something that John Lyle kind of gave me an insight into in the week that I signed for them back in 77. And you know, he told me all about the fans and, and 
what it meant to them. And um, I, I got that thing, that West Ham thing. I got that pretty early. You know, I was, I was intelligent, and you know, I, I wanted to learn a lot about the club. Uh, but I picked it up pretty quickly, and I got it. I got that. You know, I got the North, the North Bank and, and the chicken run. I, I understood it. I uh, understood where they were coming from, and I think I acted up a little bit to it. You know, I played a few games. You know, I'd have a chat with people in the crowd behind the goal when there's a corner against or for, um, and I, I enjoyed that. But you know, I loved playing at Upton Park. I just loved it. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get down there on a Saturday, which was unusual for me because I'd always been really apprehensive about what was going to happen on a Saturday, you know, when I played with my previous clubs, you know, would I do well today, you know, is it going to be all right, and well, can't wait for 20 to 5 and the final whistle goes and I've done all right. When I was playing for West Ham, and especially when we played at home, I couldn't wait to drive down Green Street in my car. I used to come down from the Forest Gate, Forest Gate end and pick up Green Street and drive down at half past one on a Saturday afternoon. And I got the vibes from the crowd, I was ready to play, I really was seeing all those claret and blue scarves and shirts and everybody piling down there towards the Berlin and towards Ken's Cafe down at the bottom end, you know, and I, I just, I couldn't wait to get on the pitch, I really couldn't, and it was a massive thing for me, because they were so good to me, those fans, you know, they, they treated me like one of their own, and even though I wasn't a real typical West Ham footballer, um, you know, they, they did like me as a player, obviously scoring goals helps, but, uh, when you're a player at the club, you never really can go to the crowd and say, oh, thanks for everything you've done. But, you know, this is my way of thanking people, really, you know, to, to be able to say the reason I got all those goals for the club was probably because of those people who were, who were in, in the terraces those, in those five years, because they helped me so much, because I felt so confident playing on that pitch. Atmosphere. I just loved it. The noise. They're the best fans in the world as far as I'm concerned. The chicken man. Oh, it thunder me. Like being next year on the wing, you know. They let you know. I, will, I think they're always happy with me. They let you know if you're not putting it in. Playing for West Ham was something that John Lyle kind of gave me an insight into. There's always going to be somebody better than you. We were that confident. You always know it's going to be a football game. You know, it's a good game of football. In the second season we were in that division, um, it does get a bit hazy from such a long way back. And I don't think we started all that well, if I recollect. Uh, and it was only after late December that I do remember everything particularly well because we got to um, almost Christmas time, the game just before the Christmas period where we played Cambridge at home on a snowy night. And I got a bad injury, I did my knee got to be taken off, knee in plaster for a, you know, a month and then rehab for a couple of months um, and I do remember that because it was so uh, frustrating not being in the side because that was the, the start of our cup run and I do remember early in December when you, you get the third round of the FA Cup draw, I remember coming back from, um, from a game, an away game and we were on the coach and we were listening to the cup draw being made. At, you know, half five, I think, on a Saturday afternoon, and um, we got West Brom away, and you know we were all we all, all went a bit flat because we knew what good side West Brom were, 
and to play them at the Hawthorns as well. You know, it's going to be a difficult game, and you always hope that this is going to be your, your year in the FA Cup. And then your third round draw is West Brom away. Oh wow! Um, subsequently, obviously, I got that injury and couldn't play in that game. And those games are always the first Saturday in January, so uh, I listened to it from my home uh, in Shenfield, hoping the lads would do well and. You know, I think everyone will remember that that was the Phil Parks big game. You know, that was the one where we realised how good Phil was. Um, I didn't see the game, obviously, but everybody came back. All the lads on the Monday said what a game Parks he had. You know, we'd have been beaten four or five if it hadn't been for Phil. And we got the draw, and then we came back and brought them to Upton Park and, and beat them, and, and then went on that cup run. Too much, too young. You done too much, much too young. You're married with a kid when you could be having fun with. Frustrating for me in some respects because my knee wasn't right. I think it was maybe the end of February, even into March, before I even got fit enough to train with the players. Um, and my first game back was the, the Swansea game, which was, I think, the fifth round. Um, and I think Paul Allen scored a goal in that game, and I got a goal. And I felt as though I was on my way back, but at least I was back in the side and, you know, fifth round of the FA Cup and now we're into the quarter final. But there are very good things happening on the employment front. For example, every month a quarter of a million people go off the unemployment register and find jobs. That's the equivalent of one person finding a job every 10 seconds. Villa in the quarter-final, a Villa team that two years later won the European Cup, you know, so a very, very good side. Uh, and it was a good chance for us to prove ourselves because we'd beaten West Brom on a replay, we'd beaten Orient, we'd beaten Swansea, and now we were going to play a big team, we were going to play Aston Villa, and if, if we were going to have any chance of proving ourselves against the big guys, then this was it. And I remember that game at Upton Park, the atmosphere was fantastic and it was a late penalty by Ray that got us through and I mean, you know, you never doubted that Ray would score when he had a penalty, never doubted him at all. If I had the choice of all the cars in the showroom, this would be the one I'd go for. The new Astra SR. Look at it. Snug Recaro seats, front wheel drive, 1600 engine, five speed gearbox, alloy wheels. I can just see myself with a stereo right up, with foot right down, and every bird turning her head and saying, Addy, bit more of the wax, bit less of the lyrical. The box all opal, better by design. Last four in that cup draw were um, for the semi finals were ourselves, Arsenal. Liverpool, Everton, and we were praying we'd get Everton without, you know, with no disrespect to Everton at all. But we didn't want Liverpool, we didn't want Arsenal because we wanted to get to the cup final. We just felt that was their, our best chance. I'm sure the Everton players thought exactly the same. They wanted West Ham because they would have thought that that was their best chance of getting to the final. Um, and sure enough, we get Everton and, and Liverpool get Arsenal. So. We had the semi-final at, uh, at Villa Park and you know, it turned out to be a strange game really because at the start Everton were just too good for us. Brian Kidd was running riot. Um, I mean he was a quality player kiddo. And then him and Ray had a bit of an altercation after over a throw in somewhere on, on, on the right hand side. They started like, slapping one another and the referee sent Brian Kidd off and didn't send Ray off, so all of a sudden, having been one nil down, we, you know, we're in a good situation playing against ten men. Stuart Pearson gets a late goal, and, and we get a draw. So, took taking that game on to Ellen Road. You know, Devitt got the first goal. Bob Latchford equalised, and once Latchford had equalised, the you know the momentum of that game was on, was going their way. It really was. You know, it was a hard fought game. Got into extra time. And then we got a throw in later on, Trevor hoisted the ball into the box. I saw one of our players alongside me and I managed to head it down. Um, 
take the weight off, off the cross from Trevor. And the next thing I knew, Frank's like dived and headed the ball. And I was right behind it. And as he headed it, I, I was really disappointed. I can remember vividly thinking, it's a shame that's going to go wide. Because it, it was, it was going wide. And then it hit a big divot on the pitch and diverted it into the corner. Um, and, it, and it went in. And then Frank did his thing down the, the corner flag. But, you know, it, it was so strange because it, uh, as he headed it, it wasn't going in. It, it was going wide. It probably doesn't be prove that on if you see footage but believe me it was going wide and it hit a big clump of mud and, and it knocked it into uh, into the corner um, and that you know that that night was probably one of the best nights I've ever had it as a footballer because knowing that you're going to play in the FA Cup final you know was a huge thing um, obviously it depended on selection but you felt that all things being equal you know the lads who got us through those uh, those last couple of games were going to be in uh, in the cup final team. So to be able to think you were playing in the FA Cup final, you know, it was brilliant, and it was it was gave us a great end to the season as well. The voices may be a bit hoarse, but these West Ham fans have plenty to shout about. And today I spoke to the man who could lead their chorus at Wembley, West Ham manager John Lyle. Five years ago you led out the team to the cup final at Wembley. Can you really believe it's happening again? Well, uh, I suppose it hasn't really sunk in, but uh, naturally I'm proud and delighted to have been part of last night. And uh, it, the first time most people say is the best, but uh, I don't know, it'll be a great pleasure to go there again. And twice in five years, obviously, is great credit to the players and the staff at the club. And of course, most of all, we're delighted for the fans. One all of extra time. What on earth goes through a manager's mind at th those times? Well, I think uh, uh, it was quoted in the papers that uh, they'd never heard a crowd uh, give it the players uh, such a great evasion. And uh, in all honesty, it was difficult to talk to them. I had to get them in a little huddle and uh, I basically I just said, keep playing and try not to get emotional about it and keep doing the things you've been doing because in the end you'll get the goal that matters. Unfortunately, we did. <laughs> did you feel deep in your heart that you would in fact win at extra time? Uh, I felt we'd taken the initiative away from them for the first half hour of the game they dominated us and then gradually uh, we kept playing our football and gradually wore them down and in all honesty I felt that if anyone was going to win it was going to be us. Could you believe it when Frank Lampard scored the winning goal? No it was incredible really because it's probably he was he found himself in a situation that uh, Oh, one wouldn't expect a fullback to be in, but uh, I think they call that total football now, so I was quite delighted with it. You went to the match last night? Oh, yeah, you? I did, yeah. You got any it's voice left? Not much, alone. <laughs> Dramatic end of the six day siege. 19 hostages, including the three Britons, are safe. The cup final was uh, something I'd really wanted to make the most of. And I know that sounds daft for a 29-year-old, fairly experienced footballer, but I played at Wembley before and not done very well. I played for Norwich in the 73 League Cup final. Um, and I, I waded up after that game that I hadn't played well, I hadn't enjoyed it. I was nervous, I was so nervous that almost it took the energy out of me and um, we didn't win. Um, and I, when I realised we were going to play in the cup final again, I looked back to that Norwich City T Tottenham game from 73 and I thought, right, I didn't play well, we lost, and I didn't enjoy it. And of those three things, I couldn't really guarantee the result, I couldn't guarantee how well I would play, but I could guarantee that I could enjoy that day. So once May 10th, 1980 came round, I made sure I enjoyed that day and I got up early, I had breakfast in the hotel, I went for a walk um, around the, I think we were in the Hendon Hall Hotel, I went, had, had a walk around that little town um, and I really wanted to, to get to Wembley and, and play in that match. I remember everything about it, I remember everything that happened in the morning, I remember the pre-match stuff on the pitch with Bob Wilson when we were all interviewed. West Ham, a club proud to have its roots in the heart of London's East End. Very much a Dockland area. In past years, sometimes a deprived area. 
lots of high-rise flats, but tremendously warm-hearted people. And the football club has always offered them football of a very particular quality. They may be in the second division, but their cup record speaks for itself. Won the cup here in 1964, the Cup Winners' Cup in 65, and the FA Cup again five years ago when they beat Fulham in the last All-London final. Well, it was a surprise to me that he changed the system. Obviously, we were a genuine 4-4-2 team, two strikers, two, four midfield players and four defenders and a goalkeeper. That's how we were. Um, and he just told me and Stuart Pearson at quarter to three that he was changing it slightly. Stuart was going to drop into midfield and play faced up as, as a midfield player. So we were going 4-5-1. Um, and I realised the implications of that for me straight away was that you know my chances of scoring were going to be very limited because playing up front on my own, I was going to have to take care of their back four. You know, it made us solid in midfield, it made us solid at the back, um, but I was going to have to take care of the whole of the back four on a 90 degree sunny afternoon at Wembley on a, you know, the biggest pitch you, you ever play on really, in, you know, in terms of the dimensions of the field. So I realised that it was going to be a difficult day for me, but um, the big thing was I was playing and I was picked. I was playing in the cup final and walking out on that day, walking up that Wembley Tunnel and walking out onto the field, you know, it's, you can never replace that. It's very hard to describe how you feel. Uh, you know, you walk up a dark tunnel, you haven't heard anything, you haven't seen anything because you're down in the, down in the bowels of the stadium until you walk up and then you walk up and then you come up, up the lip of the tunnel and, and you're on the pitch and all of a sudden you see the colour, you hit the crowd see you and the crowd erupt and you know the, the emotion you feel then is uh, is quite staggering so you know but I was playing so you know I was playing up front on my own and it was going to be a hard day for me but uh, John had got it spot on. I remember vividly Willie Young and, and particularly um, David O'Leary screaming at their bench and if you bear in mind uh, Terry Neal was the manager, Don Howe was the assistant manager and first team coach and was genuinely felt to be the best English coach around at the time and they didn't work out what we were doing. The big thing I remember was getting to half time and 1-0 and up thinking, wow, we're doing all right here, you know, 1-0 up in the cup final, you know, we, if Arsenal score and it's an equaliser, does it go to a replay, you know, we've got another chance, like the semi-final. But then it got to 10, 15, 20 minutes from time, and as that 20 minute period came, all of a sudden I, it was then that I realised we could win, and that was the difficult part, because then we could lose. You know, the fact that you could win and we were ahead, it was a horrible feeling to think, oh no, anyone makes a mistake now and, and we, it's a draw or we lose, it's going to be terrible. And the, the last few minutes were dreadful, really were dreadful, just couldn't wait for the final whistle. As Stapleton comes forward to try and deny a romantic FA Cup trial for second division West Ham. The holders grip on the trophy is within seconds of being loose. That's it, West Ham have won the cup.
once it was over, I remember just going on, on the knees and putting my head down on the pitch at Wembley because I wasn't sure how I was going to react. I'd seen people um, really emotional when they won the cup, you know, and crying. And Bobby Charlton, for instance, I think, was, was a crier. You know, Bobby Charlton, I'd seen him when they'd won big games at the World Cup final crying. And I always think, grown man crying because you won a match. And I thought, oh no, I don't want to do that myself. So if I am going to get really emotional, uh, because you, start, you, you feel all sorts of things in that game. I remember walking out on the pitch before the match, which was brilliant because before the match, everyone's equal, you know, no one's won. You're a part of that, that big occasion. And I remember thinking all my family were in the crowd. And that was a bit of an emotional thing, you know, with all my family there. You know, my father had died when I was four, uh, and you, you feel daft things in your mind, you know. I wonder, you know, I wonder if anyone's looking down on me, you know, and thinking, oh, that's my son down there. So I, I, I didn't want anyone to see me in an emotional state, so I put my head on the ground, uh, and then I realised that that wasn't going to happen, you know, I wasn't going to like, fall apart. I mean, a lot of people talk about that game and remember John Lyle's thing about playing me up front on my own and make that a massive factor. For me, the biggest factor in that game, tactically, was how well Billy Bonds and Alvin Martin played against um, Frank Stapleton and Alan Sunderland. They were two dangerous strikers, good movement, good finishers, and they never got really got a kick. I mean, they, our two lads shackled them so well. You know, they let them have the ball, they let them lay it off, but they never let them get in behind. Uh, and even if they did get in behind, Phil, you know, Phil was very safe with any any shots from distance that that uh, Stapleton and Sunderland made. So, for me, the two best players on the field that day were um, Alvin and Bill, closely followed by Stuart Pearson, who was brilliant in that role because you know having dropped off from being a striker a back to goal striker um, and being able to go into midfield and play faced up like he did in a massive game was was huge for me uh, but but Stuart was a big game player he was an internationally played 20 odd games for England you know and he used to play at Wembley he was a big game player Stuart uh, and he could play faced up like that I couldn't I was a back to goal player genuinely if I was back to goal, I knew exactly where everybody was. If you turned me around and faced me running towards the, the, the opposition goal, I lost all perspective of where I was. Um, but Stuart was brilliant on that day. But you know, for me, those three players and Phil, Phil in goal were, were our best, our best players, and, and were the biggest factor for me. Not, not the fact that I was playing up front. The tactics were good that John had, had laid out, but you know, those, uh, those, those four were for me the key to, to winning that game that day. Treasured moments these for a cup winning captain and Bonds, who joined West Ham United 13 years ago next week. A fitting time for him to come forward and meet the Duchess of Kent and receive the most famous trophy in football. Billy Bonds lifts the FA Cup for West Ham. I don't remember too much about going up and getting the medals. It all kind of gets a bit hazy. You know, I was so delighted. I remember, I remember being absolutely shattered. You know, I mean, I'd done a lot of running that day, a lot of running, and not seen much of the ball. To be fair. I do remember everything about it and I remember watching Match of the Day and listening to Jimmy Hill and bringing all that Brian Clough stuff up about Trevor Brooking floating like a butterfly and stinging like one, uh, which, you know, slapped Brian Clough a little bit around the chops when Trevor scored the winner, didn't it? But uh, it was Trevor's day that as well, you know, and that was good for us. We felt, I mean, I wanted to score, I wanted to score the winning goal. 
because I was a goal scorer and when you're the goal scorer and you score the winning goal you're everyone's hero um, but looking back it was right that Trevor should score that goal you know because he'd been such a player for us over the seasons um, and John's tactics that day fell into place so well. John Lyle's tactics have been proved successful. He made a decision about the team to play Pike and not Brush and put his faith in West Ham's best form of football philosophy, which is going forward. And this they did in the first half and then showed in the second that they can also defend. And that's a very reassuring thing for that uh, man in the picture there because John Lyle, over the years, has had to live with the fact that people have accused West Ham of being fragile at the back. But today, the players defended expertly for him and won the cup. This day, without any doubt at all, belongs to second division, West Ham United. The one memento I've got from that uh, FA Cup final, obviously other than the cup winner's medal, is, uh, is this. Which, I think it's a tradition, isn't it? You know, you go up the, to get your medal and someone in the crowd gives you their scarf and gives you a cap and uh, you put the cap on and put the scarf on and uh, you feel as though you're part of the crowd so but you know I've, I've always kept this um, and this is the very one from from that cup final. I can't remember too much about the night except that you know what we did we had a meal and went back to the hotel and, uh, and then and went to bed quite reasonably early really for me because normally I would have thought I would have lots to drink and you know go to bed in in some sort of a state and wake up with a hangover but i didn't i didn't drink till till late on and maybe only had a shandy at 12 o'clock ish To be able to be able to share it with the fans was really good. I didn't know quite what it was going to be like. I'd experienced stuff like it. We'd got promoted at Norwich, you know, ten years earlier, uh, and we had a bit of a, you know, Norwich was full of the fans in front of the town hall. But I mean, there was nothing like what it was that Sunday at East Ham Town Hall. I've never seen anything like it. I, I don't think you could never have got a car or even a bicycle down the street. You know, there's that many people just crowded in there. And that was good because um, you felt that you'd done something for those fans. You know, it was, you're very selfish as footballers, I think. You want to win for yourself. If we won, you got money. You know, we were working class in that respect. If we won, we got a bonus. So that was great. Oh, good. We've got, you know, a bonus for winning that match. I want to be in the team so I can get that bonus. I want to be in the team, I want to score so that next week I'll get picked. So we're all very selfish. But when you get back to the town hall with the FA Cup and you realise that you know what it's done for for that most thousands of people down there all dressed in claret and blue, you know, that, that makes you feel a little bit humble I think. <laughs>